the noise making thing that you have, okay? And uh, we're going to start our worship. We're glad you're all here this morning. And uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm missing something. Thank you. No magic tricks today. Just there we go. Thank you. We have some very observant people. Okay, you hopefully everybody has a, a bulletin. All right, if this is your first time here, uh, the order of worship's right here. It just tells you what we're going to be doing. When to stand, when to sit. If you like to pray, kneeling. They have kneeling there. Okay, so it's all on the left hand side inside your bulletin. So welcome all of you. Just curious. Who has never been to a worship here before? This is your first time. One, two, three, four. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so this is it. Uh, we'll, we'll try to make you feel as comfortable as possible, uh, especially if this is, you're new to this. But we're here to worship God. The children will be coming later on to sing a couple of godly songs, okay? And uh, you're welcome to come back anytime. We do have a Chinese worship, Cantonese worship, at 10 o'clock if... Uh, you speak Cantonese. Uh, we have a Mandarin worship on, at 10 o'clock on the other side at the Cambridge site. And then the rest of you probably speak English. So we're going to go through this. All right. So processional hymn. Congregation is standing. Oh, please stand. And we're going to sing the pers- uh, hymn called Holy, Holy, Holy. <clears throat> There's the words. is kneeling. We have some kneeling pads if you like to kneel, kneel. Otherwise, just have a seat. Okay. We're going to sing the call to worship and then we'll be praying together. Okay. So just try to feel close to God. Okay. You're in his sanctuary here. All right. Okay. We're going to sing this together. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together to worship you. We know that you're a good God. You're a pure God. You're a holy God. There is no evil. There is no anger. There is no malice in you. And yet, you desire us to be with you. We're just human beings, and we have a lot of flaws, and we uh, have a lot of sin, a lot of anger, a lot of evilness, a lot of selfishness, a lot of things that are not good with us. But we know that um, through your Son, Jesus Christ, these things can be forgiven. So, Father, we, we, we ask for forgiveness of those things that we've fallen short of your glory, and we want to ask you to cleanse us now. Um, so that we can worship you, we can, we can get close to you, so we can have an intimate relationship with you. We want to give you honor and glory and praise. We want to um, thank you for taking care of us, each one of us here, and our families and our loved ones, and providing uh, uh, good food, good housing. Uh, thank you, Lord, for, for sustaining us, for giving us breath and health, and you bless us blessing upon blessing, that you richly bless us, and we want to thank you for that, and we want to worship you, and we want to give you praise. And now we pray, just like Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Um, if you have the kneeling pads down, you can put them back up. Okay, we want to have them last as long as we can. Uh, thank you, choir. Okay. Um, let's see, next on the list is a hymn. We're going to sing a hymn. And I'd like to remind you that that's the choir, okay? They're supposed to sing good, okay? You're not the choir, so you don't have to sing good, all right? You don't have to sing well. Just, just sing, okay? So maybe you might not know the song, but it's okay, okay? The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, okay? You don't have to sing beautiful music. We have soloists. We have an orchestra later, and they'll make, they'll make the good sounds. You just be glad that you're here, that your heart is open, and that's the song that we're going to sing, okay? It's on page... Uh, 320, 302 in the hymnal, okay? Uh, but since you don't have hymnals, we'll put it on the screen again. It's called Rejoice, the Lord is King. All right, so just sing out, make, make a lot of noise, okay? If your children make noise, that's fine, okay? This is, this is the time to make noise, okay? Joyful noise. Okay, here we go. I don't hear you. <laughs> so either you're not singing or you don't know the song. Okay. So I'm gonna give you a, I'm gonna give you the what do you want, the, the 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 give you the benefit of the doubt. And it's not that you don't want to sing, it's that you might not know the song. So we're gonna concentrate not just we're just gonna concentrate on the last two lines, okay? Can you, okay, you see the last two lines? Let's read it together. Okay, ready? Go. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Okay, now that you heard it, you don't have to put on your reading glasses or anything. Let's read it again, okay? With intentionality. Okay, ready? We'll read it together. Here we go. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice. Again, uh, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Okay. The whole thing is rejoice, okay? That means be happy, okay? Smile. Okay, 
can you look to the person to your left and right and give them your smile, okay? Just smile at the person, okay? I don't know how to say that in Chinese. Yeah. Maybe the person behind you, the person in front of you, can you smile at them, okay? Like you're taking a picture for the Christmas uh, photo and you know, okay. So smiling is the first part of rejoicing, okay? Now, see, at first you weren't smiling, okay? But now half of you are still smiling, okay? So that's good, okay? But this part says, lift up your heart. In the Bible, in, uh, David says he can, he can lift up his heart. You can, you can encourage yourself, all right? So that's what the song is supposed to do. Help you lift up your heart, right? And then the second part, lift up your voice. That's your vocal cords. Okay, that means sing loud. No? Yeah? Chong Dai Xiang Di, okay? All right, okay. Let's do the first verse again, all right? And when the chorus comes, sing really loud. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King of all. smile okay can you turn to your left and right and smile one more time give your smile to the person next to you okay look both ways that way left right okay you might not know who they are okay but it's okay maybe we should get to know okay would you greet the person to your left and right you know I'm I'm Angela or I'm Chris. all right just uh, hello hello so just say hello and just, okay turn around all right Say hello, good morning, Josan, Neho, Nihao, Buenos Dias. Okay? Good, good. You guys do that over there? Okay. We're going to go to verse 2, okay? Rejoice. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, smile. Here we go, verse 2. Jesus the Savior. to our schedule, we are going to, um, we're going to recite or say the Apostles' Creed, okay? If this, this is your first time to come to our church, okay, even though you're, you know, people, your children might be at our school, this is what our church believes, okay? So we're going to stand, and I'm going to say it together. Would you all stand, please? Uh, it's written up there, and it's written on here, okay? Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he turned dead to the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, the Catholics have a new pope. Okay, uh, we, we are not a Holy Catholic Church Roman Catholic Church, okay? Uh, sometimes uh, when we say these things that's written in your bulletin, uh, you might not understand, okay? So you're welcome to ask us. Just call us at the church office. Or uh, next Sunday we will have a foundations class at 10 o'clock, and we, we can't explain all this stuff that we read, okay? So if you're ever confused or you want to know more about God and Christianity, just, just ask, okay? We'll, we'll be glad to explain it to you. Okay. The next part says offering and meditation. It is our practice in our church to give to God because he has blessed us and we want to give back to him, okay? So if you're inclined to give back to God, uh, we have offerings and tithes and gifts that we give back to him every Sunday. Uh, we're gonna ask the ushers to come forward to uh, receive your gifts to God. Father, we thank you for the rich blessings you give to us. Please accept these gifts as a token of our love, a sig signification of a, our love for you, that you love us unconditionally and help us, Lord, to love you uh, fully as, 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 as you want us to and as we want to. Thank you again for all your uh, provision for our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our anthem this morning will be played by our Cornerstone Orchestra. The main crux of this uh, anthem is amazing grace, that God gives us his grace uh, unconditionally.
So that was our Cornerstone Orchestra. If you uh, don't sing that well, you're welcome to blow or bow and join the orchestra, okay? So we'll be glad. When, and the, the song was called Amazing Grace. Thank you, orchestra. Thank you, um, Reverend Fong. So if you want to blow or bow, right? That, that's, what, that's what you're saying? Okay, I want to make sure. Okay. You can play too. Okay, that works as well. Uh, good morning, because it is still morning, uh, everybody. And I want to say welcome to the, uh, is it third grade parents that are here today? Third grade? I knew that. I wanted you to confirm that. Okay. Uh, welcome. We've been going through a, a series on prayer the last several weeks, and this morning we're going to actually be finishing uh, that series off. And um, as we've been going through prayer, we, uh, this series on prayer, we've been uh, reminded of the priority that we need to, to place on prayer in our lives because uh, there's lots of things happening. And uh, as we've just been looking at different prayers in the Bible, we come to understand a uh, a, a lot of things, a lot, a lot more than I would like to think, a lot more than when we first got started. One of those things would just be that, you know, we, we develop our plan as we, as we pray. You know, we don't just come to God and say, here it is, here's something I'll work down and, 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 and take it, God, and, and bless my efforts and all of this. Uh, we've come to understand that, um, that God's desire is for us to be united as believers in Christ, as a body of believers here, and that's a oneness that we talked about last week. So we're going to go in and, and look at Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I understand that in the, uh, the chronology of, of where we are in the Christian season, uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday is a couple of weeks away, and next week will be, will be Palm Sunday. But I wanted to hit the, the Garden of Gethsemane today because uh, since we've been going through prayer, this is the way I'd like to, to finish it and how Jesus prayed. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a passage in Scripture in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. 26, 36 to 46. And I'm going to put those verses up on the screens uh, to the left or to the sides of me and behind me so that if you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along. If you do have your Bibles, it's good to open them up so that you can look at it for yourself as well. Uh, even though I'm putting the, the, the verses up there, sometimes the Holy Spirit causes us to, to move and to look in different passages that, that, that were prompted as we're looking through, as we're hearing sermons, and just hear God speak to us and maybe add a little more to, to this and, and, and make it a little more flavorful for, for us individually. Okay, so we're going to be in Matthew chapters 26, uh, verses 36 to, to 46. And before we, before I read the text there, I just want to give you the background, uh, set the, the context a little bit so that uh, as we go into this passage here, we, we see where Jesus is and where he is with his disciples and all of this. And so he's with his disciples beforehand, and as he's been spending some time with them, he's been telling them about the things he's about to go through, about some of the things he's going to suffer as this uh, son of man, as God's son, things that are um, all part of God's will, things that uh, he will definitely face, even though they're not the types of things the disciples are initially expecting. Now, Jesus talks a number of times about being uh, arrested and being uh, crucified or being turned over to uh, the religious leaders and beaten and tortured and, and that he would die and that he would rise again. And the disciples didn't quite understand that as Jesus was telling them. And so they just kind of saw things from a physical standpoint. You know what I mean by that? They're just looking at the human terms and the human ways in which Jesus is operating as he's teaching and as he's walking this earth. And so when Jesus says, hey, these things are going to happen to me, I'm going to get beat up, or, or you know, uh, everyone's going to abandon me, and I'm going to be all by myself, his disciples said, no, that's not going to happen at all. You know, we're not going to abandon you. And we know that Peter said, I will never leave you, Jesus. I, I'll be with you to the very end, even if it means death for me. I'll follow you. And so that's where we are. That's where chapter, or, or chapter 26, verse 35 ends. Peter says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. 
And the thing about it is we always look at what Peter said and we say, oh, there's Peter. He's the one that was the first one, the disciple that always wanted to, to speak out. He was the one who was really impulsive. He was the one who's really passionate. He was the one who always jumped to the front of the line there and said, yes, me, 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 me. And he talked about how good he was or how devoted he was to Jesus. But it says at the end of verse 35, and all the disciples said the same. So it wasn't just Peter. We focus on Peter because he was the first one to say it. He's the one that was probably the loudest. He was the one who was, who, who was the, the, the easier target, if you will, because he was always jumping out in front of everybody. But all the other disciples said that as well. And so this is where we pick up in our passage here in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 36. And so um, I'm going to read. I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version. If you have... A different version, you'll understand why the words are not exactly the same, uh, because different translations do that. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him, taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on, the, on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to, he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going See, my betrayer is at hand. So this is uh, the word of the Lord. And um, as we get into this and as we, we start right from the beginning here, just to give you this background, and I'm going to go to uh, the first slide here that we had. Uh, in Matthew uh, 26, starting in verse 36, it says that Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally means you know, olive press. So it's a place where uh, it was outside of Jerusalem. They'd go across the valley there and go up onto this hillside, and they would find this, this place there known as Gethsemane or olive press or olive grove, as some uh, places translated in the Bible. And we're told in John chapter 18 that this was a place that Jesus and his disciples had gone to before. So it wasn't a, a, a place that was unfamiliar to them. It wasn't a place that uh, they'd never been before. It was some place that, that, that they knew, they knew about. And so as they, uh, as they went there, uh, you know, this place called Gethsemane, the olive press, the olive grove, it was, you know, there were some olive orchards close by there because that would be a place that was close to where they would process uh, olives to, to process for, for olive oil. And so he brings his disciples there. All of his disciples go with him. He brings them there. And as he goes there, he says, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he breaks away from the big group of the 11 disciples that are with him because Judas is not with him. And he takes three other disciples with him and he goes to pray. And as he's with these guys, he lets them know what's, what's in his heart, what's going on in his soul, what's going on in his spirit, because he's troubled by what's happening. And it says here that um, taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me. So Jesus is struggling within his soul about what he's going through right now, what he knows is going to be happening to him. He's told his disciples already, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be thrown into uh, and, and tortured and arrested by these uh, religious leaders. I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to rise again on the third day. He had told them this before. And so he sees the plan unfolding just the way it's supposed to be unfolding. And he knows the timing of it. He knows that in his spirit. He knows that in his soul. And it's, it's something that's bothersome to him. It says that he's, he's sorrowful and troubled. And when we think about Jesus, 
Our theology tells us that Jesus is the God-man. He is fully God and he is fully man. And so this is the testimony of the scriptures that we get there, particularly in John chapter 1 where we talk about the incarnation. And it tells us that Jesus is the God-man, that he is God and he is man. And sometimes because of that, we just focus and we say, oh, when Jesus does something that seems to be supernatural, we just say, oh, Oh, he's God. Or if he does something that seems to be a, a little bit more insightful than a, an average person, then we say, oh, see, he's, he's God there. And so we just say, hey, Jesus can do whatever because he's God. He just snap his fingers and do whatever he needs to do. He can multiply bread and fish. He can, he can feed people. He can heal people. He can walk on water. He can, he can do all that stuff. See, it's real easy for him. There's no problem there. But we forget about him experiencing all the things in humanity that we struggle with and we are tempted with. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about Jesus being a high priest who is sensitive to his followers, to the people he ministers on behalf of. And it says that he has experienced all these temptations, but yet is without sin. And so the reason that we're told that is because we're, we're to be instructed that Jesus knows what's going on. He knows what we're feeling. He knows what we're going through because he's going through it himself. It says he's so sorrowful that he feels like it says sorrowful unto death is that I'm ready to die. Not, not, not ready to die as I'm going to go jump up on the cross there, ready to die. I wish I were dead, that kind of ready to die. And so he's really passionate about this. He's really feeling it inside. And so I, I want to mention this to you because sometimes we just discount this and say, ah, he's not really struggling at all, you know? He's just going through it and it's no big deal, you know? It's like a walk in the park for Jesus. It's like, you know, plan A is just running through and there's no problems, there's no hiccups, there's no feeling along the way. But he's all in the mix of it, okay? And so as he goes through this and he says that, uh, he, he's got these, these, this inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And he said, my soul is very sorrowful in verse 38, uh, even to death. Uh, and then he tells him to remain here and watch with me. This idea of watching is to, to pray, to stay awake and pray with me. Even though he's moving a little bit away from them, they're still there. And he wants them to support him in prayer. And so he goes off on his own. And it says, uh, going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So as Jesus is you know, going through all of this, he is giving prayer proper priority in his life so that he prays effectively. Right? He's giving prayer proper authority in his life, a proper priority in his life so that he prays effectively. And so as he begins to pray, one of the things that Jesus goes through this, and this particular case is really interesting because we know this to be the will of God. We know this to be the will of God. Jesus has said this is what's going to be happening. And so as he's praying here, he says, my father... And that, the, the words, my father, there, we get uh, in, in Mark chapter 14, it breaks it down a little bit and it gives us a, this word Abba or Abba, which means daddy. It means father, but it's more familiar. It's like calling somebody daddy, you know, or here's my pops, you know. It's the person that I'm connected to. He's my father. And so they didn't used to pray like this before. Jesus encouraged his followers to pray this way. He said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven, right? He's, he's encouraged his disciples to pray this way. And so he's making this connection here and saying, hey, there's an intimacy there. There's a close relationship there, me and God. And he says, my Father, he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So first of all, the idea of a cup it is something that we see in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, I've, um, I, I've not cited on the screen here, but I have a couple of citations here on, the, on, on my notes here about this idea of a cup and what this cup is. And so the, the determination of whether this is good or bad is set within the context. Okay? So in the Old Testament, you have a couple of places uh, where this idea of cup is used. In uh, Psalm chapter 16, verse 5, uh, it says, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. 
you have made my lot secure. The idea that God is, is, is giving something, it's a just do, it's a reward, it's something that's due somebody is coming, and in this sense, it's good. So that's the idea about a cup. It's something that is coming. It's something that is due something, somebody. It's like their fate. You know, it's like their destiny in a sense. And so uh, in this sense, it's used in a good sense in the Old Testament here. Uh, Psalm 23 talks about my cup overflowing. It's like the blessings of God overflowing. Uh, it's used that way there. There's a few places in the Old Testament where it's talked about a bad thing, where it's, it's talked about a judgment there. Rise up in Isaiah chapter 51, verses 17 and verse 22. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You have drained it to its dregs, the goblet that makes men stagger. So it's this idea that this is something bad, right? And, and the thing is, when you think about a cup and drinking, you think about the idea that somebody has to voluntarily swallow that themselves, Okay? It's for them, it's their destiny, it's their fate, however words you want to look at it, but they take it for themselves. And so Jesus is here and he's struggling with this and he says, Father, if it is possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so this is kind of a very famous uh, 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 phraseology here. We say, not my will, but God's will be done. But Jesus is praying about the possibilities, right? He says, if it is possible. And, and I want you to understand something. We look at things and we look at all the options, especially some of, some of you. I don't know all of you, but I know some people are very analytical and they're just looking at, well, here's the possibility. Here's option A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know? And they got all lined up, you know, in their minds about what, what can happen here. And so as Jesus is looking at the possibilities, he understands that even though there's these possibilities, right, not every possibility Right? or not this possibility in this case, is the will of God. And I think that's something for us to understand as well because when we talk about possibilities and things that we go through, we look at the options and we say, how can I somehow or another mitigate what's going on? How can I prevent these things from happening to me, bothering me, hurting me, all those sorts of things? And so we look at all these options to avoid pain and suffering usually. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's normal. That's human. And, and you know, there's, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just kind of digress a little bit, just tangentially speak about some other things here. But there's this idea, you know, that if you think about it from the book of Genesis, and it talks about the fall of man, right? It says, when you sin, you will surely die. And it's this idea that we are in the process of decay. All right, ultimately death, separation from God until God intervenes to somehow or another save us through his son, Jesus Christ, to offer to us the salvation. But all along the way, we're trying to find ways to prevent the effects of the fall. One of the effects of the fall was talking about men in their labor, right? And I talk about men, mankind in its labor, would struggle. It's by the sweat of your brow, you will you know, you will harvest the, the bounty that comes from the, the ground. And the idea of work is not the punishment from God. It's the idea of the frustration of the struggle within work. And so some theologians go out there and they talk about technology as a way to somehow or another intervene or, or, or prevent the, the results of the fall. So it's kind of interesting, right? Because we look at technology that way, right? Hey, it's a lot easier, you know, to, to get water by just turning on your faucet than it is to have to go and, 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 and take a, you know, a bucket and go down to a water source and, and carry the buckets however long you have to carry them to get water to where you are. Uh, we went on an outing with the KC yesterday. That's our children's program that happens on Saturdays. And you know, one of the things that they have there, one of the uh, exhibits they have there is this thing that has to do with water, you know? And so they got the kids, it's a really nice museum. This is my little plug for it. If you got young kids who like hands-on things, they got all these cranks and everything like that. And so the kids are really involved in it. One kid who's just really a rambunctious kid told me at the museum, this is my best, I like this museum the best because I can touch all the stuff, you know? 
And so they have this one place where you have to crank, and it has these little, it has these little bottles of water, and it goes through the water, water like that, and you're cranking it, and it's on a, a chain, and it, and it keeps on bringing it up, and then it dumps it, and the water comes down through all these tubes and everything, and trickles here, and spins wheels, and comes down here, and fills up this thing, and then it dumps, and everything like that. And it's just kind of how it works, right? It's technology. And you just crank it like that and do that. That's a lot easier than having to carry a bunch of buckets and walk, you know, a mile or whatever to, to go and get your water, right? So technology, yeah, to prevent some of the effects of the fall. But I think also God's grace, right? Because even though God is righteous and just and he deals with our sin in a righteous and just way, he's always there with mercy. He's always there with grace, right, to, to help us out in it all. Because that's how God's heart is. And so here is, uh, getting back to the text here, I don't know why I went all off there, but I did. And now we're done. Okay, now we can get back here. So he says, hey, here's the possibility, God. If it's possible, you can remove this cup from me. I won't have to deal with it. I won't have to drink this. This will not have to be my destiny. But he says, not my will, but yours be done. And so once again, he intentionally submits himself to the will of God. Looking at the possibilities, looking at the options, and we don't know what all of those were. You know, come to think of it as you look at this and you'll find out a little bit later on. The disciples, once Jesus left them and he spent some time in prayer, he came back to them, they were asleep. So the question comes, how do we know what's being recorded here? You know, how, how do we know what Jesus was praying? And the possibility is, Maybe they're awake for the first sentence or two and then they fell asleep, you know? And they know what he was praying, okay? If you've ever fallen asleep in prayer, and I can raise my hand and say I have, okay? If you've ever fallen asleep in prayer, then then you, you can relate to the disciples there. But here it is, Jesus prays and he prays and this is what he prays and he looks at the possibilities and he says, hey, if it's possible, if there's another way, Remove this cup from me. Not my will, but yours be done. So this is a reminder that not all possibilities are the will of God. And the reason I say that is because we want to do things our own way. And, you know, I know I'm talking to some parents who are out here. And, you know, one of the things that we have to learn, and what Jesus did is he made the priority of submitting himself to the will of God looking at the possibilities, but making sure he's under the will of God. And for us, we have to do that too. Because there's this idea that travels around in young people. It's like, once I reach a certain age, I get to do whatever I want. And I have to keep saying this because we have an authority problem here in our country. You know? Where people say, I don't have to listen to anyone. I just do my own thing. After all, that's what it means to be grown up. And if we don't teach them within the church that that's not what it means to be grown up, we're going to have a whole lot of more problems down the road. And so parents, one of the best things that you can model for your kids is to get underneath the authority of God's will, where you understand and your children understand that all that's taking place in your life, everything you do, all the choices you make are based upon what God is doing in your life. Yes, we have some latitude in all of that. Yes, we can make some choices in it all. But ultimately, it has to fall underneath the authority of God. Where we spend our money, what we choose to do with our time, all those things come underneath the authority of God. And we need to model that. So let your kids say, hey, you know, let's go and spend this here. Or let's go buy this. Or we can, and, you know, we have the money. Because you have it doesn't mean that's what you should be doing. Not necessarily, right? This is God's money. Right? This is God's time. And so we need to understand that for our kids. They need to understand that, and we need to model that for them. Sunday mornings, we're worshiping together as a body of believers. Yes, I'm tired sometimes Sunday mornings. Yes, I would rather sleep in sometimes Sunday mornings. Right? If you're tired and you're worn out, yeah, you would feel like that from time to time. But that doesn't give us an excuse to go and do that. You find a way to get your rest some other time. Go to sleep a little bit earlier Saturday night. You know, instead of staying up to watch a, a, a TV show or whatever, go to sleep. Why does God have to be the one who gets cut out all the time? All right? And so we need to model that for our kids. 
Okay, so I just kind of put that in there to let you know where, what I'm thinking and how I, I see Jesus modeling that for us. He says, hey, here's the possibilities. My soul is, is heavy, and, and, and God, if it's possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So, uh, so he, he understands that those possibilities, even though there's lots of them that could be in his mind, that there's only one real possibility, and that is the will of God the Father. Moving on here and picking up in verse uh, 40, it says here, um, and he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Remember I told you that? I already, I already tipped my hand on what was going on here. Uh, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And the idea of one hour there is really one hour. Whoa. How many of you have prayed for an hour all at once recently? You don't have to raise your hands, okay? <laughs> this is not an interrogation. It's just kind of interesting, right, how we can sometimes just get our whole, our whole we get fed certain things from our society and our environment. And I, I grant you, we live in a busy time, so I, I, I agree with you there. And, and Jesus is talking to, to Peter, and he says, you guys couldn't even stay up for an hour and pray with me. Oh, so what, what is he trying to say here? I think he's, what he's trying to say here is he's telling them to resist the temptation, right? He says, you couldn't even pray for an hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So one of the things that we, not, we need to do is if we're going to be effective in prayer, we have to resist temptation. What kind of temptation are I talking about? The first temptation here is this idea to say, hey, I'm too tired, okay? I'm too tired to pray, you know how, how that works, right? It's like, it's kind of like exercise. How many of you are too tired to exercise? Okay. <laughs> you didn't have to raise your hand, but thank you anyway. Uh, you're too tired to exercise, right? We're too tired to exercise, and we feel like this. And then what happens is you get home, you've been working, whatever's been happening, you know, I don't know what you have to do, but you're tired, right? And you get home, and you say, I don't feel like exercising, okay? And you know that maybe you need to exercise. So the thing is, you're tired, but once you get going, once you get into it, I wouldn't say all the time, but probably about 80% of the time, right? You feel better after you exercise, right? You're energized and stuff. There's actually something chemically taking place within your body, right? You know, your body can, you know, emits those endorphins and you're feeling like this natural high and stuff like that. So you feel energized afterwards. Yeah, I'm good now. Now I feel like eating. Right? And I don't feel bad about eating because I just exercise too, right? And, and it works like that. And you know, the thing is, in, in my experience, right, prayer is like that too. Sometimes we feel too tired to say, oh, you know, I, I'm just too tired. I don't want to deal with it right now. You know, I've fallen asleep in mid sentence praying, okay? So I know what it means to be tired too, okay? And I'm not bragging about that. I say that with shame, okay? Because if we're supposed to be praying, then we're supposed to be praying. We're not supposed to be sleeping. And so we need to make that, you know, that priority. We need to resist that, that temptation, right, to let tiredness pre prevent us from prayer. The second thing, you know, what other temptations are there in prayer? It's the temptation to procrastinate. It's the idea. It's, oh, yeah, I heard something, and, and this is really important. I'll get around to that a little bit later on, and I'll pray about it. And we forget. We forget. We say, yeah, it's kind of important. It's, yeah, I really should pray about that. But we don't. And it kind of ties into this tiredness thing, too. It's like personal or private time with God that we have in our devotions. We say, okay, yeah, I'm really busy. I'm really tired. I was, I'm, I'm going to spend some time with you, God, before I go to sleep. And then you're so tired that you go to sleep. And you say, oh, in the morning I'll get up and I'll spend some time with you, God. And and. And you oversleep because you were so tired when you went to sleep. And then you oversleep. And you're rushing to get to where you have to go. And then you get to work and you're thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, I'll spend some time after work. And I'll, I'll spend some time with God. And I'll do that tonight after I go home and I have to prepare, you know, prepare dinner and do whatever else I have to do. And then everything else happens again. And you're busy and you're tired. And it's just kind of a cycle. We know this. How do I know it so well? Exactly. Right? Because you experience it yourself. And you deal with young people who are going through that and we're trying to get them into this discipline of spending time with God on a regular basis. 
And we realize because we live in busy times and we are time people, that unless we carve out some time for it, we usually don't give God the priority that he, he deserves. And it's a shame because it ultimately affects us. Last thing, when you talk about resisting uh, temptation when it comes to prayer here, uh, you know, I, I wrote down a couple of things here. And, and this last one is a little bit more tricky. It's this temptation not to give prayer adequate time. What do I mean by that? Uh, we have to be in the spirit of praying with God. Yeah, you can throw up prayers in any situation, wherever it is. You need God's help, amen. But there's this idea that if you're really trying to discern the will of God, you need to settle down yourself so that you can hear and discern the will of God. You can hear and discern the voice of God as he speaks to us through his word, as he's prompting us by his Holy Spirit. And, and unless you do that, you just go through life moving so fast that you miss out on what God is saying. It doesn't mean that you'll always be off track. It just means that you won't really know that you're on track. And so if we just rush through it, it's kind of like praying at, at the, I know when we pray for it at the dinner time or your meal time, you know, dear God, thank you for the food. You don't need to go an hour at dinner before the food, you know. There are some people who pray like that. And I'm not calling them out. I'm just saying, we're trying to eat, you know. Yeah. Right? So we, we pray. So we need to give ourselves adequate time there. It's kind of like settling ourselves down when we come in to worship the Lord. Right? We leave it all at the, at the footsteps of Jesus there, if you will, and just say, hey, Lord, take all of this because I want to be in your presence. I need to see you. I want to be able to bring myself to you, God, and and experience you there. And, and if you're, we're all thinking about all this other stuff going through our heads, we're not going to really be benefiting like we ought to from our times of being in the presence of the Lord here in worship. It's the same thing in our private prayer time. If we're just rushing through, hey, I'm like, you know, we're just rushing through it. And so we need to make sure we give ourselves a certain amount of time. Is it 45 minutes? Is it an hour? Is it an hour and a half? Is it two hours? Is it three hours? I don't know. But I know it's probably more than we usually give God. How do I know that? Because usually we're rushing through things. And we need to make sure that we are right in the middle of his will there, discerning what it is that he's saying to us uh, in these times. So we have to resist that temptation. Here's what happens with Jesus. After he comes back and he tells the disciples there, spirit is indeed willing, verse 41, but the flesh is weak. Uh, um, whoop, I went the wrong way. Uh, again, verse 42, again, for the second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he, again, he came and he found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So same thing happens. Jesus goes away, he prays, and he comes back and they're sleeping. Look at what his prayer is this time. It's a little bit different than the first one. He says here, my father, if this cannot pass unless I, unless I drink it, your will be done. The first one is, if it's possible, take this away from me. Now he's saying it's right there. It's kind of like the cup has moved from the realm of possibility and it's right in Jesus' face. Now it's coming his way. And he's saying, if it can pass with me not having to drink from it, so be it, but let your will be done. So he's asking again in a different way. And now that he knows this is going to be happening, he's saying, can it change? Can it be different? But whatever it is, it's your will, not mine. So he, he prays a little bit differently. And as he talks to the disciples there, he comes back and he finds them there. He doesn't wake them up again. He just lets them sleep. He says, hey, these are my homeboys, you know. We pal around all the time. They've been hanging with me for the last three years, you know. And, and, and I know all about them. He's not surprised by all of this. He's not. And he just lets them sleep. And then he goes and he prays again. And then he comes out. He comes back. And then when he talks to them, he says, hey, you know what? This is what's happening. Then he came to the uh, disciples and said to them, uh, it says here in uh, verse 45, then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And verse 47, I don't have it up there, it says, while he was still speaking, uh, other parts of the Bible say immediately 
Okay? So this is happening. It's right there. It's coming. And the last things he says to his disciples here before he can, he's going to get arrested is, you know, sleep and take your rest later on. So I think in there he's given us this reminder of saying, hey, let's put our priorities on the things of God. Yes, we get tired. Yes, we have other things to do. But let's not carve this out. Let's not cut this out, of, push it out of our schedule and say, hey, my private time with God is not something I need. It's something that we definitely need. It's something that we cannot do without. And so he says, hey, you know, make sure for yourself so our priorities need to be God's priorities. Even if the people we're with don't necessarily see that. And, and, you know, talking with young people, and I think as parents you can appreciate this, you understand this idea of peer pressure. And you want your kids to stand and do what's right and be obedient and be good students and be good citizens and all those sorts of things. And, and praise the Lord. That's the way it should be. We want them to stand on their own feet too. We want them to, to be able to, to have enough strength of character to say, hey, I, I'm not going to give in to the peer pressure. This is what Jesus tells his disciples. He says, uh, he says hey, you know, I mean, for himself, he, he gives us that example, right? They're going to sleep. I'm still going to go pray. I'm discouraged. They don't want to back me up. These are my homeboys, whatever you want to call them, you know, and they're not helping me out or they're not backing me up in all of this. I'm still going to do what I got to do. I'm still going to be true to my Lord, because this first relationship between me and God is most important. And so we have to remember that for ourselves. You might be hanging with some people who don't really put the priority of God there. They might say, hey, you know what, I, I, I really want a closer walk with God, but they're not willing to, to, to make that a priority. And if you want something different and, 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 and they can't, and being with them kind of prevents you from doing that, then maybe you need to go off on your own a little bit. I'm not advocating just trying. Some people get it wrong. They say, oh, I'm so spiritual. Oh, I, you know, it's the Elijah complex. You know, Elijah, he did this, he was this prophet for God, did this great battle there on top of this Mount Carmel there, and, and he defeated the other false prophets and everything. And then afterwards, he runs away, you know, a little bit later on because somebody wants to kill him. And he says, oh, I'm the only one who's following you, God. And God says, you're not the only one following me. I got a whole group of people over here who are following me. Don't take it upon yourself like that. There are some people who do that. I'm the only one who's holy. I'm the only one who wants to follow God. Some people are a little distorted in their thinking there. Okay? Some people got it right on the money. I'm with a group of people who don't care about God at all. All my friends are that way. You know, they might say that, and they might have it right, you know, be spot on with that. And if that's the case, then maybe there's some changes that need to happen, right, to make sure that our priorities become the priorities of God. And, and the priority that God gives is, is the priority of prayer. If we're going to be effective in prayer, we need to give prayer its proper priority. Otherwise, we, what are we going to expect out of it? I just rush through my prayers. I just kind of run around. It's, you know, you can't expect God to be doing something or for you to be effective in prayer if you're not giving him some time, if you're not focused on, uh, on being with him and putting his purposes first. So let's make this priority of prayer. Let's carve out the time to make sure that we're effective in prayer. This is what our Lord wants from us. This is what our Lord modeled for us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder as we've gone through the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, this reminder of the priority of prayer if we're going to be effective in prayer. I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to get it right, to understand that, first of all, we're going to, we need to put the priority of your will as primary in our prayers and make sure that we're under your will, God, not just asking and trying to to do our own thing there, Lord, but looking to do your will, even with all the possibilities that might be out there. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us strength for, to resist the temptations that come up because we know we like to procrastinate and our time is there and we're tired and all those things, Lord. You know all of that, but you didn't give us a free pass. You said, make it happen. And you show us that it can happen. Jesus was very busy, but yet he was always in touch with you. And so that's a reminder to us. And I pray, Lord, that 
you know, as Jesus said, told the disciples there about, you know, sleep and rest later. There's a time for us to do certain things. And you've given us this, this time and this season, what's known as the church age, to get your word out, Lord. So I pray that we would make that uh, our priority in sharing the gospel. And I pray that if we, in doing so, that we would be prayed up because we're giving your purposes priorities in our life, Lord. We can af- expect you to carry out your purposes as we make ourselves available to you in doing them. So help us to do this, Lord, for your glory and for our own benefit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song. We're going to, okay, we're going to try to sing a song. the song if you know the verse please join us here we go you who dwell in the shelter of the Lord who abide in his shadow for life say to the Lord my refuge my rock in whom I try the chorus with me here we go Eagle's wings bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. Very good. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you show us how to live. You show us how to relate with you. Help us, Lord, to take time, to to, to make the effort. Even though when things are going terribly, they're going rough, help us to to take time to talk to you, to pray to you, to ask you for help and to pay our respects and give our thanksgiving to you. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege of praying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No usher, Eddie? <laughs> okay, this is uh, Randy. Yes, Reverend Fong, this is the time of our service where we welcome our guests. Uh, we'd like to welcome all the third grade parents. Would you please stand? Hey, okay, parents, do you want to stand up so we can wave at you and stuff? All the parents and the... the good. We're glad you're here, and we're glad you put your, put your uh, children in our school. Also, if you're a guest or you brought a guest, please take this opportunity to introduce yourself or your guest. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have several announcements. Most of them, I think all of them, are printed inside your bulletin. So we don't have time to go through all the announcements. So I'm going to run through them real quickly. First slide um, talks about a lunch meeting that we're having uh, this Thursday at Sweet Tomatoes in Sunnyvale off uh, Kiefer and Lawrence Expressway. If you're there, come by and uh, have lunch with us. Okay, we'll be there from 12 noon to 1 or later. Okay, in, in Sunnyvale. The next slide. Uh, next Sunday will be Palm Sunday, and we will have a special uh, special event happening. Okay, next slide. The the event that's happening is there's an insert inside your bulletin. It's called Disability Awareness uh, uh, Seminar that we're having, and. Um, uh, you're all invited to come if you like, and we're having some people from this organization called Johnny and Friends, and they'll be opening our eyes to taking care of people that might, they might, you might be, see their disability, but you might not be able to see it. They're sort of, sometimes they're hidden and, and, you, and you can't see it. Okay, so we're going to have this seminar uh, for AK leaders and seminar. Uh, um, uh, even if you can't come to the seminar, you might have some, something to do. If you want lunch, you can fill out a form and have lunch with us too. And we'd like all the Sunday school teachers to come too. Okay, so that's next Sunday. Please fill in the form and uh, turn in your five bucks uh, 
at the information desk. Uh, if not, uh, email me, okay, and we'll make room for you. Okay, next slide. Uh, Easter is coming up. Uh, we have, next week is Palm Sunday. And the following Friday, we're having a special Good Friday um, a presentation with music and uh, video things and all kind of things, okay? They've been wor working on that a lot. It's called The Grace Story, and it starts at 7.30, and that's March 29th, Good Friday. You're all welcome to come, all right? Uh, the following few days after that, two days after that, we'll have... Um, Oh, next slide. We'll have Easter Sunday, and we have two events on Easter Sunday. Um, at 7 o'clock, we'll have our sunrise worship, okay, in the sanctuary here at 7 o'clock. And then three hours later, we'll be uh, combined worship in um, Chinese and English, okay, in the, in the school cafetorium. So you're welcome to come to either one or both of them. Okay, and lastly, we're going to wrap it up. Um, this summer, pro some we have... We have a lot of summer programs, okay, for, for elementary school, for, pre, for uh, different things. We have um, our Cornerstone Academy summer school, and we'll have our um, uh, day camp, day camp for, for people, other people who don't want to get so academic on that, all right? And we do have, um, well, we have a lot of things. We have things from middle school. Next slide talks about the camps that we're having. Okay, so we're going to have at least three camps. The first one is for college and adult people on July, June 2nd. The second one is for high schoolers, if you have any high school children that you know about, on the June 9th. And uh, June 16th, um, we'll be, um, have our middle school camp. Okay, so usually if you sign up for the summer program, you usually come, they, the children still come to the camp. All right, so that's uh, plan ahead, and you're welcome to come to any of these. Finally, um, final slide is let's welcome our third graders, okay? So let's give them a hand as they come in. And here they come. Keep welcoming them. Let's just, I'm sorry.
our third graders from Cornerstone Academy. The song that we just sang is called Love the Lord. This was a song that had a lot of movements with our whole body. It is a lot of fun to do hand motions when we sing, but God does not find that as the most important factor. What He wants is our hearts. God wants us to open up our hearts to Him when we sing. He doesn't need the prettiest voice or the best movements. He simply wants us to sing to Him. The next song we will sing is called Bless the Lord. In this song, we do not have any hand motions. We will simply use our voices and hearts to sing to Him.
big surge of applause. That was good. Hand motions and bless the Lord all my sins. Excellent. I hope you enjoyed this worship time. We want to uplift uh, the name of God and, and, and open our hearts to God's leading. Okay? Let's stand together. We're going to close by singing a song called The Doxology. And uh, here we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make time to pray to God this week, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a, have, have a good Friday and a happy Easter. Bye-bye.